Hello everyone, welcome back to part two of the video with Chopped winner Pavan. In the first video he accepted my challenge and in this video we will answer all your questions you had sent in to me and I also will edit some of my own questions because this is like a dream come true. Food triggers memories and I love to cook. Cooking is like a therapy to me. Everywhere I travel in the world I am able to taste and try different cuisines and get to know a culture. And now it was my chance to get right into a kitchen of a professional to ask him all kinds of questions and also look over his shoulder because his industry is similar to the music industry, like the path he walked, the dedication you have. There's so much to learn and also I was very inspired by his story and by his strong mindset. So let's get right to the questions and uh, I hope you like it and get inspired and learn something today. Let's go and ask them the chef. Question number one. What is the secret ingredient for cooking? That's an amazing question and I think it's actually not any particular physical ingredient that you add to food that makes it better. I think is when you have knowledge of the product you're working with or the ingredient itself. Just like when you asked me about the egg. Uh, it's simple things like understanding uh, what temperature that uh, does that protein actually change uh, color or transform or the protein coagulates or um, just knowing what it contains. Uh, what, egg is 70% water. Just knowing things like that helps you play with the food and transform it so much better. And I've realized over the years is there's no magic recipe that's gonna change you as a chef. I think it's the understanding of the ingredient and the food itself that helps you master, not master, but know the ingredient better and uh, able to uh, manipulate or transform it into something so much better. Salt, I think by far is the most important ingredient in a kitchen, but uh, understanding any product that you're working with put some time and effort into knowing a little more about it, I think is what uh, elevates food so much more. So do you have some tips like uh, for people who are watching where you can get this knowledge from? Is it just, I mean, on the internet, it's full of knowledge. Uh, the I, there's no better source than the internet. Uh, I mean, if you have the luxury and the uh, resources to spend some time with a, a professional chef, I think what happens is, because uh, because uh, what we do is we are so passionate about the food because that is literally our life or our livelihood. Uh, some of it will transfer on to you. Just like when you work with a car mechanic and they show their passion through their work then you start taking care of your car a little better because yeah. that you know you, you take on some of that I think similarly when you spend some time with a chef or you've lived with a chef or anything of that nature you start understanding their perspective and why it's such a big deal and then I think you, you learn some of that so you have to eat it live it read it it's all about experience I agree question number two what is your favorite kitchen tool my most favorite kitchen equipment to work with a blender buy a Vitamix it stays with you for life and invest in it and uh, just like a food processor or something else but a Vitamix uh, a blender to me is single-handedly the most uh, important and if you know how to manipulate and work with it uh, you can do a lot not, e not even a knife nope well I would assume you don't have to do much to have a knife if you don't have a knife I just don't don't cook number three what are some main ingredients you would suggest to make a good flavored meal Hey, have a pepper mill. It is a basic ingredient that actually takes your seasoning and flavor to the next level. When you use fresh cracked black pepper or even something simple like toasting your spices, it, it, it's a world of difference in your final product. So if you crack your black pepper, it'll be a major difference and a step up in your food game. Can of tomatoes is something I highly recommend. Uh, it's amazing. You can flavor rices. You can make sauces, you can start a base of a soup, you can make a pasta pizza, anything of that nature. And most importantly, you can build a base for so many more things that add in. Something I personally love keeping at home is a chicken base. Whether it's in a powder form or the cubes or a paste, it's amazing. My secret ingredient when I make fried rice or something I want to eat really quick is old rice. I always have rice in the fridge that's cooked. A little bit of this chicken powder uh, goes a long way some fresh green peas and a cracked egg and you have yourself some fried rice so those three things I think are definitely you'll find in my pantry is a chicken base can of tomatoes and fresh cracked black pepper so I wasn't that far away from no. having the can no nope. the lockdown food how do you actually balance long working hours in the kitchen and still deliver good quality cuisine this is like the worst time to ask that question because right now that's exactly what I miss uh, I uh, as much as uh, I wouldn't say complain, but uh, we, we understand that that's one of the most faced challenges in our business, which is the long hours and uh, the strain that comes along with the food and beverage industry in general. I think 
if you ask me one thing I miss the most right now, that's exactly what it is. It's, it, it's being in the trenches with my team. So yeah, no more complaints. <laughs> we took care of that today. If you had one thing to eat for the rest of your life, what would that be? French fries. Really? Yeah. French fries and mayonnaise. These are two. <laughs> well, I would eat French fries for the rest of my life. How I would eat it would be with mayonnaise. With whom would you like to cook with and why? My uh, very close friend Sebastian, his dad. I would like to cook with him. I've worked with Sebastian for almost a decade now and he comes from a pretty, pretty impressive uh, I wouldn't say his background, he can't cook to save his life, but a very, very impressive uh, culinary family. Just to see how the business has transitioned from when they were cooking to now how they've had to adapt and still keep themselves relevant. I think just to be able to cook with someone of that much heritage and background and knowledge invested in them, uh, I think that is something I would like to pick his brain a little bit and probably hopefully cook with him someday. So a little a little a little more info about uh, Sebastian's background, parents background, they're French. Uh, Sebastian is, uh, I like to say he's uh, French in the morning and New Yorker in the night, but yes. Uh, <laughs> Dangerous combination. Yeah, amazing family, really wanted to cook with Mr. Dumanier, senior Chef Jean-Louis. Hopefully one day our paths cross and I get to cook with him. He seems like a lot of fun also, so. He's got impeccable camera presence and uh, his comic timing is amazing. On point? On point. <laughs> we come to that later. Which chef do you admire the most? I mean, you just uh, answered the question with who you want to share the kitchen with. Well, yeah. admire, uh, big word, I admire quite a few. One chef I'm very captured by is uh, Chef Marco Pierre White. If I'm not wrong, one, the first chef from Britain to get three Michelin stars. He's groomed so many chefs. I mean, from Gordon Ramsay, they were all his men uh, mentees. Uh, he was their mentor. I mean, he's one of the few more prominent ones people would recognize if I it took names. But uh, Marco Pierre White, he is probably a very, very good reflection of what, how chefs became larger than life. All the problems in a chef's world, uh, the lifestyle ups and the downs and, and, and the fame that comes with it or the drama that comes with it. Uh, it's If you ever get a chance, watch a few of his documentaries or White Heat is a book I recommend. Or watch Marco Pierre White on YouTube and you'll you'll see, it, he's he's a little older now, but anything he said, you'll feel it. He, there's no denying it. But I'm very captured by that guy. Inspired also. The best piece of advice you would give a home onto Shust. Best piece of advice? Put on a freaking apron. You see this? It's called an apron. I see a lot of these guys not wearing one. And sometimes I see some videos and they end up being funny and sometimes you're not that lucky. Because a lot of people are now cooking a lot more at home. Uh, please take safety precautions. I've seen just as many fails or bloopers, if you will, <laughs> as many as I've seen good videos. So sometimes I worry about some uh, kitchen accidents that happen and they're not fun. I, I, no, no, no. Kitchen accidents are not fun, guys. Put on an apron. What is the craziest food you have ever eaten? Two ingredients. It's got to be sea cucumber and balut, the preserved uh, egg from the Philippines. Uh, yeah, that's a tough one to stomach. It's an acquired taste as well. So as long as you put the vinegar or the suka, however they say it, but it's. I felt like I, I ate it without bringing it back out. The sea cucumber was tasted pretty much like nothing. It's gelatinous. It's chewy. It's it's the textural. Thing, it's the mind block you got to get over which a lot of Southeast Asian cuisine I think is uh, based off textures so as long as you're accustomed to it you yeah. palate it well what do you think about durian Have jackfruit you ever... you're pretty close jackfruit is actually something that's similar looks like it but isn't as pungent and I grew up eating jackfruit <laughs> and jackfruit actually uh, is a very very good substitute for vegetarians they braise them, it eats like pulled pork. If you've ever roasted jackfruit, guys, it literally eats like, take a half a jackfruit or a quarter of it that they sell in the supermarkets now or specialty stores, roast it, pull it off. It literally eats like pulled pork. You can put barbecue sauce, you can put it in anything. Trust me on this. Or next time we do a cooking episode, we'll cook with jackfruit. Oh, wow. Durian is a similar fruit, 10 times as worse if, if your tolerance for uh, the weird, uh, it's got a very floral, aromatic, yet pungent smell. That does trigger a certain feeling, the nauseous, uh, <laughs> I can't stand it. I've had it. Yeah, the texture is very custardy. Yeah, it stays with you. I, that's that's it something. It stays with you forever. I think once you tried it, I tried Memory it Memory for sure stays with you forever. But uh, 
Yeah, I, I, I'm not a big fan. No, okay, and we are on the same level. One promoter actually made me try it, and durian ice cream. I've and had durian ice cream. I was like, hell no. Now you hate ice cream too, not right? Again. <laughs> Almost. What's the biggest challenge you face every day in the kitchen? I think it's the ever-changing uh, scenario we want. No one day is the same. One day there's a water leak. It doesn't matter what kind of kitchen you come from and what establishment. Every day the clock is against you. By five o'clock, A, B, C, and D is there. But the challenge that comes with it is, Chef, today the walk-in freezer shut off on us. Or uh, there's a leak over this. So every day you have a plan and then you throw the plan out and you still have to meet the deadline, but with a new challenge. So that's what, so every day I walk in, I come in and when I get my rundown of what's going on, uh, whether it's from the executive sous chef or the chef de cuisine who's in charge uh, of that shift, they let us know that we walk in and the rundown goes like, well, everything's going well, but the fish order is not here. Everything's going well, but such and such is not here. That's the biggest challenge. It keeps us on our toes and uh, frankly speaking, uh, that's what makes this business fun. Do you freak out sometimes, stress out about it or get nervous? Not anymore? I initially, yeah. So I'm at a point in my life where I know it's a challenge and we have to deal with it. So uh, we'll work on the solution can't change the problem. No, same with the music. When the music shuts off, you need to improvise. Make it happen. The last supper meal. What would that be? The last supper. The supper Shit. Yes. <laughs> Hell yeah, I would eat this one dish that I crave a lot, which actually I'm surprised I don't eat enough for how much I love it. It's called biryani. Multiple countries from the Middle East to Turkey. I mean, it's, it's taken its own transition around the world. It's basically a pilaf. Biryani, the last supper meal. Yeah. Tell us one of your most embarrassing cooking moments. Yeah, it happens all the time. I mean, uh, I, I preach on basics and stress on fundamentals so much. It's like when you make a dumb mistake and you skip a step and it always ends up biting you in the ass. I've done it, I put a blender on there and I always tell the guys, listen, don't put a blender, a jar on that without a lid because you never know when someone hits the button and you know, next thing you know, you're wearing the sauce. And things like that have happened and luckily sometimes they happen in your own kitchen at home and you, you look around, you still look around saying no one's gonna call you out on it. There's one thing uh, that I hate doing is toasting pine nuts. Why? Because they roast too fast? Correct. This has got to be some sort of a record. I think nine out of ten times, I still burn them. No way. I refuse to toast pine nuts. How do you test the quality of your ingredients? Uh, well, we're, we're trained for that. Product development, product knowledge is uh, one of the basic skill sets that uh, when I went to culinary school, I think it was the first class I took was product knowledge. Uh, and that goes down to basics on how to inspect a head of cabbage or how to look at fish and how the eyes have to be bright and how uh, the flesh, uh, flesh of the fish has to be firm and springy. And so I took a class on, on this. Uh, I had professional culinary training on this. And then obviously over the years, as you work with chefs, uh, I spent time as a butcher. I spent time as, so when I spent time as a butcher, I, I'll never forget, Paulie the butcher, uh, he would always tell me, uh, this is how it's gotta be, this is how it's gotta be. Uh, you learn on the job. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. That's majority of it. What is the best cooking tip you would give someone to start? Best cooking tip, prep first. Prepare your ingredients first. The basics are the most important. I think if you use the right tool for the right job. It's a lot of home cooks start with like, oh, I don't have a spatula, so I'm gonna try flipping this egg with this metal spoon. And then the egg breaks, and then the yolk is all over. And now it doesn't look like how you made it, chef. Yeah, right tool for the right job. Uh, for example, like I was stressing when we were cooking, if you only have two pieces of fish to sear and you're gonna sear it in a pan that big, you're gonna end up not being able to control the heat. So now you're gonna burn the fish or it's gonna cook or dry out. It's just doing the right thing for the right job. Uh, right tools for the right job, preparing ahead of time. Uh, just, uh, I always tell people, until you're that proficient or you've mastered a certain skill set to a point where you've done it for X number of years and you're very comfortable, where you can prep and cook at the same time, I still recommend have everything prepared. It helps you think better your thought process, it's just like when you work, right? Uh, I don't know how you guys work, but if your cables are all bundled up and behind, the, you just can't, it's not that your music's gonna change, but it's, it's just your thought process and your workflow. When things are uh, aligned properly, it just makes for a better product. So that, I think, uh, I think preparation is 90%. 10% is execution. Planning and preparation is 90% of the game. What is your greatest accomplishment in your career so far? It would be the relationships I've built in the last 15 years. 
that I would consider my greatest accomplishments. I am happy to say I could pick up the phone today and uh, call my colleagues, my mentors, my mentees, my students, or people I've trained under, and I think I have a very, very good relationship, I would like to say, at least with majority of them. I think that is my biggest accomplishment. And at the end of the day, I would say uh, food or some other business, we're in the, the people business. So I think that's my biggest accomplishment, is I think I can very, very happily and proudly say that uh, I've managed to do well in that uh, in that department. Where do you actually get your inspiration from? Uh, eating, uh, for single-handedly. Uh, I think uh, I, I get inspired when I eat. I'm always trying to chase something or relive a memory or whether it's uh, a mango that I ate in the backyard from my grandma's house or whether it's a certain dish my mom used to make. That lives on forever, and I, I and I think it's a big therapy too. Now in doctors, I mean aromatherapy and all this, it's huge. I think food is something that literally is equivalent to travel. I, it, it can take you back in time and memory, like that. There's things you can eat, and it would take you back instantly. Oh, I uh, I feel that one too. Even with like music, music triggers memories, and so does food. And um, what you mentioned, like eating that mango from the garden or eating that bread from your hometown bakery you can't find anywhere else in the world than just there. And when you bite something that's remotely close to that, it literally triggers off something in your brain that releases that happiness yeah. factor. What's your biggest disappointment as a chef? Biggest disappointment as a chef? I think I didn't know earlier on in my career that it would take so much to get so far. What I mean by disappointment, I have no regrets, so don't confuse that with that, is a lot of young chefs or uh, myself included, didn't know what it would take to get get through, or I don't know what the line is or where you think you've made it or you haven't made it, That's, that depends on everybody, but there's a lot of time, effort, uh, energy, relation, I mean, everything in which way, which is in any job, I believe, in our business is a little taxing, I, I like to say. There's a lot of sacrifice that goes into this line of work. You're not prepared for it, because all that's in your face with the media is, the success rate and how it could look when you're on the other side. Nobody tells you when you come out of culinary school after taking on a hundred thousand dollar loan uh, that you're probably still going to start as a prep cook. Nobody tells you that. Uh, you know it, but you choose to ignore it because all you see is uh, Emer Lagasse on TV. And uh, guess what? There's only one or two of him. And even after 20, 30, 40 years in the business, there's probably a really good chance you won't get remotely as close. So I always tell people when they say, I love to cook, I want to be a chef, this is my standard answer. I said, I'm glad you love to cook, but you should love it so much or enough to put up with all the other bullshit that comes with it. Today's world, I get to cook, if I'm lucky, 30 minutes to an hour a day on the line. And I get to spend that time with a line cook or pass on the information or share the information. My day is not 30 minutes. My day is a lot more than that. But I have to work around the rest of the day. The reward now is the cooking itself. And I get to do that for a little bit. So you should love it enough to, uh, to, to sustain like that. Because earlier on, that's all I did is cooking. But now when I'm on this side of the line and I get to look at all of it, you should love it enough to put up with that one line cook who messes up a lot more than you would like. Or deal with mistakes that you really don't believe should have happened. Your patience level. You get home and if you have a significant other then constantly saying, well, not even this Christmas or not even... And you still gotta... Because it's very easy for all that to add up. Yep. So, and I'm sure that's with your profession or anybody else who's uh, involved in their profession very, very deeply. You gotta love it enough to put up with everything else that comes with it. Absolutely, I agree to that. A lot of people think, you know, when you start, oh, within two years I'm going to be the big, uh, the big rock star playing all the big stages. And I hear that often too from people. And, you know, I want to play. I want to play on that stage. I want to play on a festival. I want to play in a club. It's like, well, you know, it takes a lot of time to build a name, to to create and build skills. And also, Rome was built in one day. You are like more than 20 years now in the business. No, 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 no. I'm, I'm just about 15. Okay, 15. Well, yeah. 15 is still like. A, uh, a decade, pretty much like me too, myself, being yeah. in there and uh, always challenging yourself, growing. And I don't think I would make it 20 years. I, I, no, I, no I, I, I always tell myself I'm going to do this enough to put myself in a position where I'm comfortable 
to where then I can cook and do the very same thing I'm doing right now, but on my own terms. Makes uh, sense. Yeah, uh, I wouldn't change my profession. I, I would just do it because that's what I love doing. When are you the happiest at work? When I'm cooking. Uh, when I'm cooking or when I'm with my colleagues. Uh, like I said, cooking is a good, good, and uh, for me, I'll actually uh, a professional excuse to spend time with people who share a uh, similar or the same passion. So that's when I'm the happiest. Even now, I mean, even through lockdown, I think all the chefs and myself and a lot of my friends, uh, we find so much joy in still talking about food or uh, mocking each other or bringing up <laughs> uh, bringing up stuff. Uh, I, I'm going to say it and my sous chef's going to yell at me for this probably. Or uh, He posted a picture of ma him making uh, meatballs and the rest of us were like, hey, your stove's a little dirty, huh? And we literally dogged him for a couple of days until he posted a picture of him cleaning up his stove. <laughs> but uh, I mean, so food is what unifies us, but at the end of the day, it's the people. So I think that's what uh, I look forward to is again, spending time in the kitchen, but with the crew. That is the key, the crew. And you guys, we ran through all your questions. I want to thank Pavan for joining me, letting me into his kitchen showing us some magic with um, food which was left in my fridge during lockdown. Hey, you're still here and watching. That's great news. Thank you guys. I hope you liked this video and you got inspired a little bit about Pavan's story. I also will link him here. I hope we answered your questions. If you have more, shoot them over. We will be happy to answer them. I think this was a great opportunity to look into someone else's kitchen because I love to cook and I get inspired by life stories, by cooking and by eating food. For more suggestions, let us know if we should get back into the kitchen or cover another subject in a world of nine or ask somebody else to take with me in front of this camera and ask them my questions. So for now guys, thank you for watching. Give us a thumbs up if you liked the video and let me know what else you would like to see here. Thank you guys for sharing good vibes. I hope you got inspired. Get into the kitchen for some uh, cooking. And if you have a great dish, let me know. I might come and ring on your door and ask you some questions. So for now, stay well and I'll catch you very, very soon. Let's see how this turns out. Uh, oh, <sighs> these, these, these. Thank you guys for tuning in for this month, for this week's video. And uh, I hope to be back really, really soon. Thank you guys. <laughs> <laughs>